The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Vaccines versus variants. The race is on as a third wave was announced this week. Tonight, we'll track the progress and the risks ahead. Then, our Ontario hubs update the COVID situation in Thunder Bay and provide insight on how crisis response teams work in that city. Also from family caregivers with loved ones in long-term care to how the virus spread in Canada, the Agenda's Week in Review looks back at a year of COVID. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. It's Friday, March 19th, and that's next on The Agenda. First, the good news. Ontario's booking system for vaccinations came online this week. But the bad news. Due to growth in the variants of concern, Ontario's Chief Medical Officer David Williams has declared that the province is officially in a third wave. With us to better understand where we're at and where we're headed, in the nation's capital, Rewa Dionandin, epidemiologist and associate professor at the University of Ottawa's Faculty of Health Sciences, and here in the provincial capital, Ashley Chute, infectious disease epidemiologist at the University of Toronto's Dalalana School of Public Health. Hi, welcome back to you both. Hi. Hi. My voice sounds a little bit off. I lost it from yelling at my children. No, I was communicating, not yelling. <laughs> um, but uh, happy to have you here. We have a lot to get into in the next 25 or so minutes. Um, Ray Watt, so on Thursday, Dr. Williams announced that the province is officially in a third wave. What does that mean? Well, it means that we're in the third, hopefully final surge of this pandemic. The numbers are rising, they're mounting fast, and it looks like our ICUs will be quite stressed very soon. This time around, I don't know if the mortality rate will be as high because we have vaccinated most of our long-term care and retirement home residents, but the focus of the disease is shifting to the younger demographic, demographic rather, from those between 40 and 79. And the new variants appear to be as lethal in that group. So I anticipate some suffering. This is now a health systems crisis as it was a year ago, less of a mortal crisis, but a crisis nonetheless. I know um, people are tired. Uh, there's a lot of frustration. A lot of families have lost loved ones and there's been a lot of pain this past year. Dr. Williams said that it is a third wave, but he said, quote, it is just a matter of what kind of wave it is. Uh, if we're in a third wave, why is the type of wave important? important to identify, Ray Watt. A type of wave. Well, I think what he means by that is, is this going to be one with extraordinary death toll? Is it going to be one with extraordinary ICU usage or one with just cases mounting? We hope it's the last one. It's unlikely, though. It's likely going to be something with uh, extraordinary ICU usage and possibly uh, considerable death as well. But depending on how we respond, how quickly we respond and how much we vaccinate ahead of this, we may be able to shorten the uh, the wave to something not like the last one maybe a few weeks rather than months we'll see what happens you know and Ashley, leading up to the announcement, uh, we've been hearing that there is a possibility of a third wave because of variants, uh, variants of concern. What are these variants and why are they called variants of concern? <laughs> so they're called variants of concern because they're they're basically changes from the original variants that were circulating, and they're concerning. <laughs> the, the name sort of tells, tells us what it is. The reason that they're concerning is because they're, 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 the virus has changed over time since it's been with us for you know over a year now. It's, it's acquired mutations or changes to its genetic material, and some of those changes have made it more transmissible. So that means that if a person is infected, they can spread it more easily to other people. And some of these changes have made the, the variants resistant to virus, to vaccines, so they don't respond as well, or you don't mount a strong immune response to the vaccines. And some of them are more lethal. So if you do get infected, you're you're more likely to die. And so these are, you know, it, it, it's sort of part of the natural evolution of, of any sort of pathogen, but it, it makes our, our response over the next couple of months really important because we are dealing with with these changed changed variants of, of the virus and, and our control becomes more challenging. 
Um, would you, would it be safe then to say that this is a different pandemic or is this just an extension of the same pandemic? The, the way that I think about this is that there are really two pandemics happening right now. So we have the pandemic, which was of the original variant. And then underneath, we've had this, this new pandemic, which are these new variants of concern that are more transmissible, that, you know, some of which are more, cause more severe illness that was happening you know, since we first recognized it in, in Ontario at the end of December, we started first seeing cases. And it's been sort of happening without us seeing it. We knew that the cases were here. We knew that they were starting to spread. But overall, in the province, we were seeing declining cases. But underneath that, the, the cases of variants were increasing. And what we're seeing right now in terms of this increase in cases is the, the variants have have established a foothold, they're transmitting more readily in our population, and that's what's contributing to this resurgence in cases. Um, you said that we didn't see this. How did we not see this coming? Um, <laughs> to be honest, we saw this coming. I mean, we, we, we knew that the variants were here. We had surveillance in place, you know, thanks to other countries that have had really good genomic surveillance. We, we were looking for these variants. I think, you know, when I when I said we didn't see this, what I meant is, you know, if we look at the epidemic curve, I think we had a false sense of security in January when we saw case, cases declining. That, you know, it's a little bit hard to see these these variants establishing their, their foothold because, you know, initially with exponential growth, you start with small numbers of cases and those can grow really rapidly. And, and so it's, you know, it takes a bit of time for that to become established. But once it becomes established, things can change. The situation can change really rapidly. Um, one of the way that I guess uh, the government has been com communicating the numbers in the province are the daily press, uh, the when they release the numbers on a daily basis. But Raywat, um, those numbers don't really reflect what's happening right now. How come? There's a lag. You know, there's a lag in reporting. There's a lag in testing. There's also a lag in genomic surveillance. So by which I mean. Uh, determining what proportion of our cases are in fact new variants, that takes time. So there is a full genomic disentangling of the virus to analyze uh, which ones are in fact new variants, and that's a resource intensive process. We have a hand waving method using what's called the S gene failure method. So the PCR tests target different portions of the genes, and the S gene is the one that the new mutations apparently have a problem with uh, adhering to the PCR. So. Long story short, um, there are different ways of assessing whether or not the variants are present. I'm not a lab guy. I don't fully understand it, but my understanding is it takes time. As a result, any data you see now is probably uh, too old. So is there a point in doing that, Ashley? Yeah, there's a number of reasons that we want to do that. First of all, is as I said, you know, we have these parallel epidemics happening. And so even if the data are delayed, it, we, we need to understand what's happening. And, you know, as Raywat was describing, there's a fast test that we can do, and then there's a slower test. And so that that initial test that we can do to screen for these variants of concern is, is delayed, but it's, you know, a couple of days. So that information comes to us in a more timely manner. And then it takes a bit longer to do the full genomic workup. Um, but, you know, the reason that we want to look for this is because, first of all, we need to understand what we're dealing with. And second of all, you know, the genomic epidemiology is really important because, the variants that we see right now are not the only variants that we're going to have to deal with. We need to be able to identify new ones that emerge. And the only way that we can do that is via this genomic surveillance. Um, and you know, before we started taping, and Raywat, I hope I'm not putting you on blast, but you actually said that you thought this uh, pandemic would last uh, four years. Um, in the span of a year, we have a vaccine, <laughs> and we actually have multiple vaccines now from people uh, to choose from in a, in a window of a year. Um, yet, there has been controversy about one vaccine, the AstraZeneca. Uh, how come? A couple of things. One is the reports of uh, blood clots and some European populations, and the other is whether or not this vaccine is relevant for those over 65. So let's deal with the first one first, the blood clotting issue. So apparently we have about 30 cases of severe blood clots, some leading to death, in a population of vaccinated people of about 5 million or 15 million, depending upon which denominator you want to use. That works out to an incidence rate of 0.0006%. Is that a lot? Well, the, the regular incidence in the general public is like 0.02%. And if you're like on uh, contraceptive medication, if you're a woman who's uh, a childbearing years, the risk is 0.09%. 
if you're a hospitalized person or taking a flight within 48 hours of a flight, your risk of having this issue is two to 10%. So even if there is a causal relationship between the blood clots and the vaccine, and that's not been shown yet, it might just be coincidental, it seems that it's far more likely to experience blood clots if you're not on the vaccine. So I think that's fairly overblown, the risk. And the other issue, of course, is, uh, is this vaccine relevant for those over 65? Now, the clinical trials that AstraZeneca first submitted didn't enroll a sufficient number of el older people for some statisticians to feel confident in computing an efficacy score. That's different from saying it doesn't work. You know, so they're saying we just can't be sure the numbers are right. Since then, we have real-life data coming out of places like England and Scotland showing that, yeah, it is quite efficacious amongst those who are older. Therefore, the real-life data is always better than the clinical trial data, in my opinion, so it is right for us to use that vaccine in an older population. I think these controversies are understandable, mm -hmm. given that this is the most scrutinized vaccine campaign in human history, and that any small bump is going to be amplified by media. Rightfully so, that's media's job. But we have to keep things in proportion. And the proportion here is, overall, whatever risk exists is minuscule compared to the potential benefit of getting vaccinated in which, sorry, with whatever vaccine that Health Canada has okayed, because they're all comparatively safe and efficacious. Um, you know, I'm glad that you pointed that out, um, because I think people are very nervous. I think a lot of people's nerves are frayed after this past year. Um, Ashley, when you look around uh, the world, where is the approval process for AstraZeneca uh, globally? So, so I mean, the the AstraZeneca vaccine is, is approved, you know, in various countries around the world, I, I think it's it's a it's a pretty fluid situation. I mean, the one place where it hasn't been approved yet is the United States, and that's because they have different um, requirements in terms of um, the the trial data that they that they're requiring. And I I think you know it's really important. You know, Raywat was describing the risks that have you know these signals that have been coming up in terms of the, the safety of the vaccine. And I think it's really important. You know, first of all to for everyone to recognize that, you know, that that's part of the process of, of using new vaccines in populations is that, you know, we, we, we need that surveillance. We need people to be looking for those signals because we need to investigate them. We need to understand what's going on. And, you know, there, there are going to be setbacks. You know, it's possible that, you know, we, we will see, you know, recommendations change. We may see things that, you know, are no longer recommended for certain population groups. But that, that's really part of what happens as we move from a trial, which is done in a pretty small population group, to, you know, starting to vaccinate millions of people. As we are going to start picking up these signals, we are going to potentially have to pivot or change or, and, and again, you know, that, that, that's part of science working. And I think it's, it's reassuring that, you know, we're, we're finding these signals and we're investigating them and we're responding. Um, and so the AstraZeneca vaccine, is that the one that the U.S. Mm -hmm. is giving Canada? Yeah. But they haven't approved it for Americans. No, so that I think that's part of the reason that they're giving it is that they they have this vaccine um, in warehouses, but the, they ha it hasn't been approved yet. So, so how do you get Canadians than, then? Not to interrupt you, sorry. Then how do you, if Canadians hear that, then how do you get them to understand that uh, the, having the vaccine is better than not having it? I, I mean, it's. It, it, it's com it's complicated. You know, every every country is has approved different vaccines, and every country has different processes for approving vaccines. Mm -hmm. I think at this point, you know, as Raywat was saying, you know, the risks associated with the vaccine are so much lower than the risks associated with getting COVID. And again, you know, I think people need to be reassured that you know, whenever there are worrying signals, people are investigating this, and that you know, we we've seen this in Europe. They, they stopped vaccinating with AstraZeneca as soon as they had the signal. They reviewed the evidence and they, you know, have decided to proceed, making sure that people understand what the risks are. So, you know, in Germany, they now include information for people who are getting vaccinated that there has been this association that they're investigating with, with clot and, and so that, you know, you can make an informed decision. Um, you know, as the Ontario rollout um, begins to happen, Ray Watt, uh, one of the suggestions that's been made that maybe would be beneficial to people in the hot zones is that target the hot zones first. Um, how, does that make sense? Before I answer that question, I think it's important to point out that the messaging around vaccines needs to be simplified. It has to be something very basic, like all the vaccines that we've okayed keep you out of the hospital and they all keep you out of the morgue. And the goal here 
is to get some immunity into as many people as possible so we go back to normal faster. All right, let's keep it simple. And I think that simple message has been lost somewhere in how we communicate vaccination. We talk about risk, we talk about efficaciousness, we talk about all these other issues. So people are, are waiting for the better dose months down the line rather than taking what's offered to them now based upon what they see in the media. They all keep you out of the hospital, they all keep you out of the morgue. That's all we should care about. But to answer your question, does it make sense to focus in the hot zones? There are different ways of thinking about vaccine deployment. Uh, there's the epidemiological perspective and you know what what keeps people out of the hospital more, what keeps the epidemic curve uh, less, what gets us faster to herd immunity. Then there's also the equity issue where people feel this is a, a fair way of distribution. So disentangling those factors is difficult. I think it does make sense to pour water where the fire is brightest and harshest, to use that metaphor. Mm. That's the way we get the emergency under control fastest. But that's only possible if people go along with it. I'm fond of saying that public health is the art of the possible, and what is possible is gated by what people will tolerate. And if you're in a non-hot zone area wondering, why does Toronto get all the vaccine doses? Toronto gets everything. Why doesn't North Bay get vaccines? I understand, right? And so you have to balance that need for at least the appearance of equity against the need to control the uh, the emergency. So that's a complicated, equivocal <laughs> answer I gave you, but it's a complicated. Well, I mean, to, to on the flip side, there's been reports that people who don't live in Toronto have been getting vaccines that are supposed to be for people in Toronto because they might be um, uh, frontline workers, but they don't live in Toronto. They live um, outside of the GTA. Um, when you do look at the numbers Ashley, does it make sense to maybe target the hot, uh, hot zones first if we want to get these numbers down? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a combination. I think it's, you know, we want to protect the most vulnerable and what predicts the likelihood that you get really sick from COVID or that you die, you know, the most obvious risk factor is, is age. But look, where you live is also associated with that risk. And so you know, I think our initial focus was rightly on getting this into long-term care home residents um, and, you know, and getting this into the, our el most elder population. But at this point, I do think that targeting these these risk areas, these higher risk areas, it does make a lot of sense, but it needs to be done in a way that makes sure that, you know, you know with any sort of prioritization, it's difficult because we have a scarce resource that everybody wants. And so you have to make sure that, you, you know, you have to make these difficult decisions but I do think that this idea of, of, you know, recognizing that risk isn't distributed equally across the province and that um, making sure that the people who have, you know, throughout this pandemic have been at increased risk and have been out doing essential work and putting themselves, you know, basically on the front lines should, should have access to the vaccine. Um, the U.S., um, there's been a, if you are on social media, there seems to be this kind of uh, competition. Well, people in Canada are very envious of what's happening in the U.S. because I think um, all adults are supposed to be vaccinated by May. You could, I think, May or June. Um, and Canada lost its capacity to manufacture its own vaccine uh, vaccines decades ago, and we've seen the negative effects of having to uh, rely on other countries. Arewa, what lessons have we learned about vaccine sovereignty through this pandemic? Oh, boy, there's so much to unpack here. We'll be talking about this for years when this is over. So losing the ability to manufacture vaccines has really crippled our ability, I think, to get sufficient doses into Canadian arms as quickly as we can. And I'm glad that we're focused now on rebuilding that capacity to some large extent. Number one, we're going to need to create boosters probably, uh, if not this year, then next year, and possibly the year after that, because as the variants emerge, some will escape our current vaccines, and so we should all line up and get our boosters. And by the way, we will win that arms race because we have the technology to do so. So the ability to produce sufficient boosters for our own country is important. Number two is other pandemics are coming. And the ability to have live vaccine platforms, multiple platforms using mRNA technology, viral vector technology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, increases our species' ability to respond faster and to prevent this level of global emergency. That's the one thing, well, one of many things we've learned from this, is having the ability to pivot quickly and to create new treatments and, and vaccines and preventatives um, is essential for our wherewithal and our economy. Pair that with the need to invest in surveillance, global and local disease surveillance, to keep an eye on places where people uh, associate with animals 
intimately because that's where these things tend to arise from zoonotic diseases where diseases jump from animal populations into human populations. We do that to some extent. We can certainly increase our capacity. And now there's a global thirst for this kind of investment. And by the way, it is inexpensive compared to the responses you would need to enact if this gets out of control. So those two things alone, vaccine platforms alive and uh, increased disease surveillance, I think will pay great dividends down the road. And Ashley, I'd like your th thoughts on that too. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think, you know, the the ability to manufacture vaccines is is going to be increasingly important. We saw we saw what a sort of mistake it was during during this pandemic. And you know, the, the important thing to remember is that, you know, it it benefits not only us, but also the rest of the world. The more places that can quickly scale up and and manufacture vaccines means that everybody can have access to vaccines. And, you know, we're so focused on what's happening in Ontario and what's happening in the United States. But we need to remember that we have an entire population around the world that we need to vaccinate. And so having more countries with the capacity to, to manufacture vaccines is, is going to be critical, you know, as, as we navigate this pandemic, as we figure out, you know, what sort of boosters we need in the coming years, and as we prepare for, for future health threats. Uh, why should people, because I think um, we have maybe part of the media, the media has been doing this a lot. We have the vaccine, our lives can go back to normal. But Ashley, once we do get the vaccines, why should we, what should we keep in mind about how this uh, virus operates? So, you know, I, I think everybody is so excited about the idea of getting vaccinated and putting this behind us. But I think the one thing that we've learned from this virus is that it's it's not that predictable. I mean, on the one hand, it is predictable. It was a, a new virus. Their population didn't have any immunity to it, and it, it wreaked a lot of havoc. But it also, you know, the, the variance of concern was something that, you know, on the one hand, you might have predicted, but the speed with which they became an issue, I don't think anybody really anticipated. And so... You know, we hear a lot of talk about this being a race between vaccines and, and the virus and these variants of concern. But I think it's more a, a game of strategy where, you know, the, the virus seems to have this ability to outsmart us, not to anthropomorphize it. But, you know, I think when we, we have this sense of confidence that, you know, we we finally outsmarted it, there, you know, it, it changes, it mutates, it it has it has this this basically you know, it's a bit of a race and it's a bit of a game. And so I think we need to think, you know, beyond, you know, the next couple months and think about, you know, how, how do we make sure that, you know, again, you know, thinking globally, um, because this isn't going to go away until it, you know, the the entire world is, is, is vaccinated, but also think about, you know, how do we monitor for any new variants that emerge? Mm -hmm. How do we monitor our, our individual immunity? So how frequently do we need to get boosted for this? And again, you know, looking beyond SARS-CoV-2 and thinking about how do we monitor for future pandemics, because this, this is not going to be the last one. Um, you know, we are in a third wave. I want to circle back to the beginning of our conversation. We're in a third wave, but parts of Ontario are reopening. Um, they have been calls for another lockdown, I think up to a month. That's the number that has been suggested. How realistic is that, Ray Watt, considering the economic challenges that a lot of businesses have experienced um, and the political will? I don't see a lot of will for it, to be honest, at least not at the provincial level. I think at certain hot zones, it, it's going to happen for sure. Um, I think it should happen across the board because that's our best way to stop it quickly. And when we stop it quickly, by the way, it's stopped for good, more or less. I don't anticipate any further economic restrictions after this spring as vaccination rolls out uh, in earnest. But I don't see the political or public will to enact uh, a a provincial wide restriction. So it's going to be a, a region by region affair. Having said that, there are things we can do to make sure that this region by region affair is more impactful than it could be otherwise. We can really ramp up our testing and tracing and isolation. And every citizen has it in our power to voluntarily restrict our contacts. That's probably the best way I think that individuals could contribute to this. You don't have to go to the restaurant, even though the restaurant's open. You don't have to go to the gym, even though it's open. And I feel bad for restaurant owners and gym owners saying that, but we can still minimize our exposures and slow the disease process, even though things are open.
But how realistic is is uh, is it to say that when um, it's been a year already, and I think for uh, there's a lot of people who would say that I've done everything right for the past year, um, I can't do this anymore. Yeah, it's hard. Uh, I liken this to a movie, and we're in the third act of the action movie. In the third act, you fight the biggest foe. Oftentimes, the biggest foe isn't the fiercest foe. It's just because the hero is too tired, and we are quite tired now. But it is the third act, which means when this is done, things get easier. There are also directed DVD sequels that no one ever watches about how, <laughs> you know, the government screws up as far as later on, and you know, a new variant emerges, and you know, whatever. But the bulk of the crisis will be done soon, I think. And so I think uh, what people have to get in their minds is this is the final thing we're asking you to do at this scale. After this, it's simply a matter of submitting to uh, booster shots and occasional screening tests and so forth. But if we can survive, uh, survive is the right word, if we can persevere the next two, three months of more hardship, then the sun will come up and it will stay up for a while. I want to leave on a moment of hope, um, or even just reflection. Uh, Ashley, over the past year, what has made you hopeful about the current pre uh, predicament that we're in? I, I mean, far and away, the vaccines are, are the good news story here. I remember, you know, a year ago, doing some projections in terms of where I thought we were going, and we ran the model for two years. And, you know, we're showing, you know, these restrictions in place for two years. And I remember having this sense of, you know, you know, people were talking about a vaccine, but I really didn't think it was realistic. And, you know, here we are a year later, we have multiple vaccines. We've gone through a really incredibly difficult year, but you know we're at a point now where there is an end in sight, where vaccines really are going to change the game. You know they've already changed the game in terms of protecting um, residents in long-term term care homes, and you know I think you know this as terrible as this pandemic has been, it's also shown how how remarkable science is and how it really can can step up and, and help us. And Ray Watt, same question. I have two two positive takeaways. First is, as Ashley mentioned, the mRNA vaccines in particular have been extraordinary. They are a game changer. We can use these for cancer, for Ebola, for HIV possibly. All kinds of opportunities are open to us now. In addition, as new variants arise, we will win the arms race because the mRNA vaccines take, what, 48 hours? to create after we've sequenced the genome and two to six weeks to put into production. That's an enormous advantage in speed of response that the human species now has the advantage in when, when combating a disease like this. Mm -hmm. The second thing I'm positive about is the thirst for science, literacy, and education. This has been uh, a failure of Western civilization, frankly, the last couple of decades. We've retreated from the desire to learn the hard things. And now people have awoken to the fact that we have a crisis of numeracy and science literacy. And the thirst to, to re-engage with that process is real, and I'm quite uh, excited to be a part of it. And um, looking back on the past year, Ashley, what makes you say, ha, huh, I never saw that coming? <laughs> there is a lot I didn't see coming. Um, I, I think, you know, again, you know, I, I just said, you know, we ran this out for two years. And so I knew that we were going to be in this for the long haul. But the, actually living through this and like the length of time and how time feels simultaneously really fast and really slow and sort of the the fatigue that everyone feels, you know, you can come up with these sort of models that say, well, we just need to do this for, for six months or for three weeks. But the reality of, of that actually implementing and this sort of lack of political will and political support for some of the hard work that we needed to do was something that, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't have seen or predicted um, last January. And Ray Watt, I'll give you the last minute. The, um, the the barrier in responding to this pandemic wasn't resources, it wasn't the virus, it wasn't anything technical. As, as noted, science gave us vaccines in under, under a year. The barrier was people, and I was surprised by that. Mm -hmm. And people uh, presented problems in terms of political will, in terms of active disinformation, in terms of you know actual threats towards public health officials. It's been saddening to watch how we are our worst enemies. And that means we need to reinvest in civic responsibilities, more so than uh, uh, scientific wherewithal. So 
this has always been a crisis, it turns out, of the human will and the human character. And now we can cogitate upon that truth for the next couple of years and wonder what we did wrong and where can we go better. And just to, to wrap up um, with what Ashley said, you know, we're all in this together. If one of us has this, uh, none of us are safe. Um, as always, I learned so much from both of you. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. We appreciate you making time uh, for us because I know your schedules are very, very busy. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you very you. much. This week, Federal Minister of Health and Member of Parliament for Thunder Bay Superior North, Patty Haidu, called the Lakehead a COVID hotspot. Here to give us an update on that and on a new crisis intervention initiative underway there in Red Rock on the north shore of Lake Superior, Sharnell Anderson, who covers the northwestern part of the province for Ontario Hubs. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Jan. So earlier on, Thunder Bay had done a pretty decent job in controlling the virus. What happened? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, here in the Northwest, it's a uh, pretty beautiful, um, relatively isolated location. And so for much of 2020, um, our COVID-19 cases were relatively low. Um, but that changed in the fall. Uh, there was an outbreak among some pickleball players. And then there was an outbreak in uh, Southbridge Roseview, a long-term care home. Um, Unfortunately, that resulted in the death of about 23 residents there. But still, it was mainly um, institutional outbreaks at this point that were driving the numbers. Uh, and that remained true uh, true through January uh, with the announcement of two outbreaks in two correctional facilities in the city. Um, so those were declared on January 6th. And by the time they resolved, um, uh, they infected nearly 200 inmates and correctional staff. Um, I also understand there were at least four inmates released while positive for COVID-19. Um, and so about a month, about a month after uh, the jail outbreak was announced, the Thunder Bay District Health Unit announced an outbreak among um, the vulnerably housed population, so people who uh, are experiencing homelessness or vulnerably housed. Um, and so that was in February, not long after that. Uh, the numbers started rising kind of throughout the community. Um, and so that rise has been reflected in the number of people in hospital with COVID-19. So um, as of yesterday, there were 39 people um, from the Thunder Bay region in the hospital receiving COVID-19 uh, treatment for COVID-19. Um, and 12 of those were in the intensive care unit. Um, as well, there was an outbreak declared in the hospital last week in its uh, 1A medicine unit. So that prompted the hospital to go into lockdown. Um, and then the following day, they started sending um, intensive care patients to other hospitals in southern and eastern Ontario. Now, I'm sure this is not a title that Thunder Bay wants. Um, currently, Thunder Bay region has the most COVID-19 cases per capita in the entire province. Um, with, you know, there are some other contributing factors in how this virus is spreading. Can you share what uh, experts have been telling you? Mm -hmm. So I spoke to uh, Dr. Janice Mill, who's the medical officer of health at the Thunder Bay District Health Unit, and um, she had actually published a video on March 8th, so about two weeks ago, saying that COVID-19 is essentially everywhere. Um, and so uh, up until this point now, um, we've uh, the outbreaks in the correctional facilities have been resolved. Mm -hmm. um, meanwhile, the outbreak in the vulnerable population remains ongoing. But, uh, you know, Dr. DeMille emphasized that there are a number of factors contributing to the spread. Um, you know, she's heard anecdotally about, about people gathering together, uh, children's birthday parties, you know, just more people interacting. And of course, that's how this virus spreads, right? Um, as well, uh, there's been a variant of concern um, identified in the region. Um, we don't know exactly what it is yet, but um, we do know that it's here now. Now, under the province's uh, COVID-19 response framework, uh, Thunder Bay region right now is in the gray zone, which means lockdown. Uh, what are we hearing from in terms of government response and the public health units? What are they doing? Right. So, I mean, so a number of politicians, um, as well as uh, Dr. Janet DeMille, they want the province to declare uh, Thunder Bay a COVID-19 hotspot. So, uh, for example, that would have allowed possibly Thunder Bay to participate in um, the AstraZeneca pilot uh, project that we're seeing in places like Toronto, where the pharmacies are um, administering the vaccines. So that is not happening in Thunder Bay right now. Um, however, we have received, I believe, a thousand additional uh uh, doses of the Moderna vaccine this week. And so that is above and beyond what we would have been, uh, what we would have received otherwise. 
Um, and in terms of uh, other support, you know, the province and NGOs have, um, they've provided support in terms of contact tracing as well as um, human resources uh, for the isolation shelter. Um, and so we're still waiting to hear about federal support. Um, as you said, mm -hmm. uh, Patty Haidu, um, uh, so she made an announcement the other day. She's from Thunder Bay, right? Um, and she said that uh, they're working on um, some support uh, for the isolation shelters. And that was a request from the city of Thunder Bay when they uh, declared a state of emergency on February, uh, in early February. I want to actually move to another uh, kind of crisis. Uh, you were working on a story about Thunder Bay's recently launched update to its crisis response unit. Can you tell us about this program? Yeah, so uh, back in January, the IMPACT team was launched in Thunder Bay. Um, and so IMPACT stands for, let me see if I can remember, um, <laughs> Integrated Mobile Police Assessment Crisis Team. Um, and so essentially what it is, is it's uh, teams of two, one police officer and one uh, mental health wor uh, crisis worker. Um, and what they do, so there you can see uh, Constable Jeff Elvish and um, Victoria Lane, who is the crisis worker. Um, and so they ride together and they respond to mental health calls together. And there's uh, a photo of the team training. Uh, so there are police officers as well as the crisis workers. They did that training in uh, 2020 kind of. Um, prior to the launch of the IMPACT team. Um, and so the IMPACT team is a partnership between the Thunder Bay Police, the Canadian Mental Health Association, and the Thunder Bay uh, Regional Health Sciences Center. And it actually builds upon a previous initiative, which was called the Joint Mobile Crisis Response. Um, but the difference is now there's kind of more integration between um, the police and the crisis workers. Uh, so they ride together, as I mentioned. And uh, also this program runs 24 hours a day instead of 12 hours a day uh, as its predecessor was running. Now, I'm curious, what led to the, the creation of the team? What was the need? Um, yeah, so uh, in Thunder Bay specifically, uh, mental health calls have been on the rise throughout the last five or six years. So, um, for example, uh, in 2014, there were uh, just over 1,000, 1,055 mental health calls uh, made to the Thunder Bay Police, and that rose to about 1,800 in 2020. Um, and so before the launch of these initiatives, uh, police officers would were often tied up in the hospital. Um, waiting for a patient to be admitted. And so it was always two police officers responding to these calls. Um, and so that's two police officers who are waiting in the hospital like five, six, seven hours. And then, you know, maybe another team responds to another mental health call, then there's four officers waiting in the hospital. So uh, that was a big issue for them. Um, but this is also about, you know, connecting people to the right services because not everyone needs to go to the hospital, right? You know, maybe there's more appropriate um, care in the community and so the impact team has more knowledge and more resources in terms of being able to connect people to a uh, more appropriate service. Now, this may sound like a dumb question, but I, I am curious, how did police come to respond to mental health crises in the first place? Yeah, I, I was wondering about that, too, when I started working on this. And, you know, because a lot of people say that, you know, maybe the police aren't the ones who should be responding to mental health calls, right? You know, maybe they don't have the resources necessary. So, um but of course, you know, the world we live in, oftentimes it is the police who are responding to mental health calls. And that kind of goes back to the 1960s um, over these policies. Um, the government started instituting policies of deinstitutionalization, so moving people out of psychiatric care facilities um, in hopes that they can receive care in the community. And so the government has done a good job of getting people out of the facilities, but a lot of the times um, the services haven't. Um, kept up with the demand, right? So that's why oftentimes we see the police responding to these calls. And so these mobile crisis response teams like IMPACT have been established as a way to uh, de decrease police presence on mental health calls. Now we have less than a minute left and I, I wanna touch on sort of the results. We know this program, it's not the first in the province. There are other police services in Niagara and Hamilton and in Sudbury that are doing it. Do we have an idea of whether this crisis response initiative is actually working? I mean, yeah. So locally in Thunder Bay, um, over a six week period, um, they have uh, some statistics. And so they were able to divert 40% um, of people um, away from the hospital. So it is working in that sense. Um, and I believe when people do end up in hospital, it's a bit of a quicker process. Um, in general, though, I spoke to an expert who said 
Um, he studied mobile crisis response teams, and you know he said they are promising in terms of reducing uh, the police presence, as well as um, they're associated with decreases in use of force and unnecessary unnecessary hospital transfers. So um, I think they are a promising initiative, and that's why you see them all over the province now. Charnel, I want to thank you so much for bringing a very important story uh, to us tonight. That's Charnel Anderson, our Northwestern Ontario Hub journalist. Thanks, Jan. As we mark the one-year anniversary of Ontario's first declaration of a state of emergency, the agenda this week looked back at how a new coronavirus spread across this country and asked whether the pandemic exposed some weaknesses in how democratic governments responded. The agenda's week in review begins hearing from family caregivers about this COVID year in long-term care. Sherry, maybe you can start us off here. I, I want to know more about what it means to be, quote unquote, an essential family caregiver and what that has meant for you over the past year. Start us off there, if you would. Well, I can tell you the first six months was very long, six months waiting and wondering when we'd ever be able to get back in. So when we were able to last summer, uh, hear this word of essential caregiver. It was uh, um, exciting and thrilling to think we might be able to get back in. And so um, in our case, we were able to get back in late August of last year, which was six months. And it was just so, uh, I can't tell you the feeling of being able to go back in and, and hug my dad for the first time. It was wonderful. Can you tell us a little bit more about that moment, going that long a period of time without being able to hug or kiss uh, a family member, particularly a parent, uh, must have been just gruesome. So how did that moment go? It was a bit um, odd because, of course, the, the staff there, um, you know, we're seeing, they're seeing family members come in for the first time. And it was all a little bit, uh, everyone was a bit trepidatious, not wondering, not wanting to get too close to one another. They were, the, the staff were excited to see us as well. But it was really, really um, exciting for me to go in. It was very, very emotional. Um, but, but very good on the same hand that, uh, you know, we were going to be able to go in more regularly and, and get on a schedule again and, and see them. Um, uh, even though, you know, they might not remember us, it was still good for them to have somebody besides the staff have their eyes and ears on them. Right. Julian, let me bring you in right now. And as I do so, I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, to bring up a picture. And I'd like you to tell us who the three people are in that picture. Well, in the middle is my my bonus mom. I call her my bonus mom. That's uh, Mary Lou Kennedy and uh, my lovely wife Heather on on the, on the right, I guess, and I think me on the other side. And we were uh, celebrating her 92nd birthday at her um, my brother-in-law's home, and uh, that was last year. That was last year, 2020 in March, actually. Now you call her your yeah, bonus mom, but she's she's your mother-in-law, right? Yeah, I call her my bonus mom. I call her my second mom. I, I like to term bonus bonus mom. I have a bonus uh, daughter too, um, so I call her. She's really that 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 special to me. And what was important about that moment that you got on on camera there? Well, it was her birthday, and we were celebrating. We were just about to leave, and and uh, I don't know. It was just a shot that happened, and. Uh, we had had a great evening. It was just before the pandemic happened. It was just before the lockdown came into effect of maybe a day or two. And uh, we had brought uh, Mary Lou over and uh, and uh, celebrated her birthday together with her family. And everybody was there and um, had a great time. And she was fluent, uh, lovely, fun. I did a bunch of video as well. Great. Yeah. Great. Crystal, what's the tell us the significance of the past year for you in terms of this story we're covering tonight? Well, yeah, this story tonight has a, a huge significance for me because my mother's on a secure unit. And uh, during the pandemic, a secure unit is where you lock up the people that are uh, shoppers or walkers. It's a small prison in long-term care, basically. Um, I know people don't like us to use those words, but what I watched happen to my mother on the secure unit over years and what we watched through the pandemic was deterioration. 
and it was horrible to stand outside there in the window. I could stand outside and see my mother inside, and I could see the deterioration of the other residents. So it was very, very, very difficult. And for me, the pandemic has been about advocating for the rights of family caregivers and all the other residents in the home, because we have 238 residents in our home, four floors, um, what I could see on the small little 17 person secure unit we knew was happening throughout the home. So it was very tragic for me. The only weapon we had against COVID in March and April of last year was in staying apart and using measures like hand hygiene and wearing masks to prevent droplets from getting from person to person. And so all you could do at the beginning was to go broad and say, we, we, we need to stop transmission of this virus. And we're probably willing to go overboard. We'd rather go overboard with stopping transmission than go under, which means that we're gonna do everything we can think of. The goal was to stop everything that was not essential to life in the next two weeks. As time has gone on, we've tried to get a little more sophisticated about thinking about where the risks are, you know, as as Dr. Furness said, we we figured out that is droplets that are the major issue. So now you can start talking about how well masks work. And that means that the, the high risk places are the places you take your mask off. Okay, so uh, restaurants are a particular problem and, and we can get a little smarter about what things we can have open and what things we cannot have open. But we're still um, really struggling, I think, with what we, we want to have everything open up to the limit of, you know, uh, letting the cases go too high again and overwhelming our healthcare system and having too many people die. Um, figuring out where that limit is, it remains a really difficult thing to do. Yeah, Jennifer, maybe you can pick up the story there because clearly uh, places like Toronto and Peel, um, the nation's capital for a, for a piece as well, were, were really suffering. <laughs> But then you got lots of places north of the French River where they were having no cases at all, and yet the entire province was being shut down. What had to happen for the government of Ontario to say, you know, we can take a bit of a more systematic, sophisticated approach to this. We don't have to shut the whole province down, just the areas that we're really concerned about. Well, you know, I think it's still very much an open question as to what the best approach for locking down is and whether, you know, regions should be locked down together or if entire swaths of the province should be locked down um, simultaneously. There is research showing that it doesn't work as well to lock down in a piecemeal fashion when there's high mobility between areas. And so, you know, some studies out of Europe, for example, have shown that lockdowns are more efficient, more effective and faster if you lock down a big, you know, area, a big geographic area with a lot of interconnected movement versus just some of these very targeted small local lockdowns. And actually, I think in Ontario, we've seen that just locking down some regions and not others um, creates what they call these leaky lockdowns, where people will move from a hot spot like Toronto to, say, Niagara region, where there were lower case counts. And, you know, I spoke to the medical officer in Niagara, and the first six um, variants of concern that they detected in that region, five of them were linked to travelers from Toronto. So, you know, Toronto was in lockdown, Niagara had opened up a bit, but that kind of movement was happening. Colin Furness, can I get you on that? I mean, we, we uh, <laughs> before we started taping, uh, we joked about the fact that uh, Toronto was in lockdown, but York Region, just on the other side of Steeles Avenue, wasn't. Does it make sense when obviously the virus does not respect Steeles Avenue, <laughs> does it make sense to only lock down the city but leave the region on the other side of the street open? The problem with doing big, wide lockdowns, although they are efficient, is that they cause more harm. That they're that they're they there's going to be less there's going to be less capacity to do that without getting really harmed. I think what we didn't do is enough public education to say, please don't do this, and here is why. We pleaded. Mr. Ford's been on TV pleading with people, no question. He's been doing that. But I think you can't just tell people what not to do. You need to tell them why. And I think we have not, as a province, as a country for that matter, done a decent job of public education. 
before the crisis as well as during the crisis, just in terms of how public health works and how communicable disease works. So I think we could have done a better job, but I'm not sure locking everything down all at once would be sustainable for the lengths of time that we've done it. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Kelly Lee, let's pick up the story with tracking and tracing cases. Uh, there are those who say in public health, these are hugely important things to do in order to get a handle on the virus. How well have we done at that? Well, it's a mixed picture. Um, I think, well, we, early on, if we go right back to the beginning around New Year's, um, the Public Health Agency of Canada did actually pick up the earliest signals. We have something called the Global Public Health Intelligence Network, GFIN, which actually provides that early warning data. And it, it did report on December 31st when everybody else also heard about these cases. The problem is that we don't have a robust system of actually doing something with that data, that we don't have a system of risk assessment and then really firm decision making to take forward actions that are needed. And we found this out, um, you know, as we went along. Let's start with this graphic here. A year into the pandemic, we want to just sort of take stock and see how different jurisdictions around the world have been coping. So Sheldon Osmond, if you would, let's bring this up here. This is COVID-19 confirmed deaths per million people. And the United Kingdom is actually at the top of this chart, 1,851 confirmed COVID deaths per million people. The United States comes next, 1614. Then the European Union, just under 1,300. Canada, just under 600. Australia, 35 and change. New Zealand, well down the list, only 5.4. China, 3.4. And Taiwan, less than one. That from worldindata.org. Ian, start us off in this. The Director General of the World Health Organization declared last month that, and here's the quote, in many ways, China actually is setting a new standard for outbreak response. So let's start with that. Has the authoritarian Chinese dealt with this pandemic better than the democratic West? Ish. Uh, number one of all the numbers that you put up there, uh, that's the Chinese number is the one that deserves an asterisk. Uh, we don't completely buy uh, that they've been straightforward with their people or the rest of the world about exactly how many people have died from COVID. The numbers are not going to look like American numbers, but they're probably a multiple of the numbers that they're actually showing. Secondly, we do know that the fact that the Chinese government covered up uh, the initial outbreak, human to human transmission of coronavirus for weeks uh, while hundreds of thousands of Chinese from Wuhan were leaving, not just Wuhan, but leaving the country, uh, this pandemic would not have occurred if the authoritarian Chinese government had been as responsive and as transparent about the outbreak as the Canadian government, the American government, the Australian government would have been. So it's, it's, it is disingenuous to simply say China wins on the back of all of this. But certainly after the Chinese took recognition of what had happened on the ground and started combating it, they've been incredibly effective for a country of 1.4 billion. They, they have incredible surveillance. They have extraordinary uh, 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 authority. They have the ability to lock down their people. And that allowed them not only to restart their supply chain, really by la last May, June, while the rest of us were still reeling, responding to coronavirus, but it also meant that China was the only major economy in the world last year uh, that experienced growth. So both from an absolute uh, health care um, and numbers of people killed perspective and also the ability of the economy to rebound, there have been real capacity that the Chinese authoritarian government has shown that they can indeed respond effectively to a pandemic. Well, that leads nicely to my next question for Amir, which is that, you know, there is an argument that Western democracies are making that we ought to be better at fighting pandemics because, of course, transparency is a big part of who we are, public trust, collaboration among different levels of government and with society, and therefore we ought to be better than authoritarian governments at fighting these kinds of global pandemics. What does the past year tell you about how firmly we can make that argument? I don't think you can. I, I simply think the data that you showed, Steve, is, is unarguable. Uh, certain governments categorized as democratic have done an awful job. Certain others, New Zealand, Australia, have done a brilliant job. Uh, Taiwan, and more than that, by the way. Look, at, at the end of the day, this is the point that I think is overlooked in the debate. 
The number of deaths you get from COVID is both because of an agent and a cause, but the virus is not the cause. The virus is the agent of disease. The cause of the disease is your the strength of your political institutions and their resolve to fight the virus, be it a, an authoritarian state like China or a democratic state like Canada. The agent of all those deaths is government in both cases. And what we've seen is that you can have a strong agent that stands up against, uh, sorry, strong cause um, in the government standing up against the virus in a democracy or in a dictatorship. It doesn't actually matter. What matters to this apolitical virus, the virus has no politics. It doesn't care about democracy. It doesn't care about dictatorship. What matters is the strength of the measures you adopt to fight it. That's just some of what we covered this week on the agenda. For more, including the full conversations, you can visit our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's it for this Friday, March 19th, 2021. Next week, Ontario brings down its budget. We'll talk to the finance minister and run the numbers. Plus, we'll bring you feature interviews with former governor of the Bank of Canada, Mark Carney, and also speak with New York Times columnist and author, Ross Douthat. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thank you for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. Have a great weekend, and Steve will see you on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. Ontario hubs are made possible by the Barry and Laurie Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman. And by viewers like you. Thank you.